Welcome to episode 7 of the Dracos.ir podcast. In this episode, I'll be discussing some Dark Age hoods and cloaks. And I have some amazing guests today with Val Thomas, herbalist, witch, author and teacher. And it was only much later that I realised that so many of the remedies in the Anglo-Saxon medical manuscripts are actually things that are you know, perfectly similar to what we do as medical herbalists today. And in Meet the Maker, the very talented fee from Dancing Magpie Art, on how she uses the people and places she meets on her reenactment and life journey to inspire her artwork and on the human need to create art. And there's examples of it, sort of the Neolithic art, so you have the last coat, I think it's last coat, with the hand prints on the wall. Oh, yes, yeah. Yeah, so it's probably sort of the first one print, isn't it, where some human has gone and coated their hand in whatever the paint would have been, um, and then just put the hand on the wall. And they think about how small children react around paint. They paddle their hands around in the paint, and then they'll just like barely paint on the wallpaper or, you know, the carpet or anywhere else. But it's sort of, it seems like a human need to mark make. Fee also designed my Dracos.ir logo based on my own thoughts and ideas, as well as some runestone iconography. Thanks, Fee. I just love it. And in Contemplation Corner today, the wonderful spiritual guide Adam takes us on a journey through the Sabbat of Beltane and its traditions. The Great Wheel of the Year has now turned to Beltane. Along with Samhain, Beltane is the most important festival of the year. First, let's take a trip into the Dracos Den. What's occurring from the workshop? All right. So I get messages now and then asking me for cloak commissions. And normally my answer is buy a piece of wool, secure it on a shoulder, easy peasy. If you wanted to hem the edges in case your wool frayed, I'm sure you can manage that. Incidentally, that's related to my podcast number three about weaving, about how tablet woven bands can be added at the start of a warp weighted loom piece of cloth to help secure the edges as well as look nice. So grey find example number one. From Birka, the 9th and 10th centuries, they have found small pieces which suggest cloaks with a raised pile or sheep's wool pile, rogfarfelder or varafelder type. In Evebo in Norway, a bit earlier at the 6th century, still the most wonderful example of a tablet woven band around a yarl's cloak were these animal pictures. Definitely one I'm going to have a go at one day. Staying on iconography, it's the mammon cloak of the 10th century Denmark. One of the few examples of embroidery from Viking garments. As this picture from the Museum of Denmark shows, the grave also had embroidery on cushions, his tunic, his cloak, other items depicting leopards, acanthus vines, small and large masks, birds, trees and beasts. So in general, Dark Age societies in the UK specify hoods as a separate item to a full-length cloak. And for women, that might include Anglo-Saxon female cape as the most awesome Penelope Walton Rogers says in her article, a veil covering the head and shoulders, sometimes a cloak or shawl, 
And then you've got artwork examples like this one of King Edgar, who's Saxon, and he knows it. So as a final thought on wool cloaks, some Birka graves were found with cloak pins by the hips. So there's a fun fireside game. Pin the cloak on the Viking. So this Orkney hood is small and therefore thought of as child-sized, dates from the Iron Age and was found in a peat bog in St Andrew's Parish on Orkney. It's woven in a wanna and you have these lovely long tassels hanging down, which I've been told by the Picts it's for the rain to run off. I attempted a version last year. It took me ages to get the hood shape right to have just the one seam down the front of the hood. There is a tablet woven band all around the outside of the hood that the tassels are secured into. My version, not too shabby. Staying on hoods, you have the reenactor favourite, Schuldham Hood. I've put Caleb from Project Broadaxe's webpage in the links below as he details all the grey find links very precisely. Thanks, Caleb. It was found on an island off the coast of Norway, carbon dated in 2009 to 1050 to 1090. There are some thoughts on whether the person in the grave was Sami or Viking which would obviously have an influence on clothing styles. What about a coat of some kind? Well, you could have this Anglo-Saxon wraparound number found in grey finds and on the Sutton Hoo helm, where even gold brocade weaving might have been used. Very nice. In a similar wraparound design, the clap and rock from 10th century Hedeby and also appearing at the waterfront on Friday night. I mean, they aren't they on tour? From 10th century Hedeby, this can have side slits. It might even be lined and have fake fur trim. Fab you less. Then a find from Birka which is fastened from the neck to waist with decorative bands across the body. There's some thoughts that this garment was influenced by Byzantine Scaramangian, which was an, a garment from the emperor. Phew! Much to ponder over about keeping warm. I think with all the sheep's fleece I have, I'd love to have a go at one using the fake fur effect. Might be a next winter job now, though. Let's now hear, let's now hear from the amazing Val and the witch's leg. Tom Penny, I'm now speaking with Val Thomas. Which spellcrafter, writer, and herbalist interested in traditional crafts for as long as she can remember? So, Val, what first interested you in discovering more about herbs? Well, I'd always loved herbs as a child. I was lucky enough to live in a house that had a garden, and my parents grew things like rosemary and lavender and sage. And those things which smell so delicious with all their volatile oils in them really attracted me. And I just love the idea of, of working with these herbs and plants. And my mother used some for cooking, but she never used them for, for anything else. She wasn't interested in, in anything kind of magical or uh, medicinal. Um, so I read a lot. And as I grew up, I got more books about herbs and, and, and just read and bought a few herbs for myself and kept them. I, I remember the first, one of the first herbs I read about in Paul Hewson's Mastering Herbalism was hyssop. And I thought, oh, I must have some of that. And, and I managed to buy myself a little pot of, of hyssop and, and keep that. 
Um, but I really didn't know because I had no experience and nobody to guide me where I should take this to, to, to learn more about it. And I think really I wanted to be a herbalist, but my parents told me there's no such thing, you know, it's not something that you can do. But I loved uh, English at school and I loved English literature. So it was natural that I was packed off to university to study English. And I went to York University and it was fortunate for me that they had an excellent uh, department there for Anglo-Saxon literature. And I studied with the wonderful Professor Bradley who has translated lots of Anglo-Saxon poetry, but he was also interested in, in other um, types of Anglo-Saxon literature and introduced us to the Anglo-Saxon medical texts from the 10th and 11th century. Oh, At wow. least that's the, the manuscripts that, that we have uh, available to us at the moment. And I was absolutely thrilled to discover these. Um, and I, I spent many hours at King's Manor in York, poring over translations uh, of these texts and reading little bits of them in the original as well. And I was so fascinated by it that when we uh, decided to have an open day for the university, I managed to persuade some friends that we should make up some of the remedies oh, yeah. and give them to people during the course of the open day. Oh, how fantastic. I mean, this, this was 1977. And of course, it would just would not be allowed these days. But we mixed <laughs> up all the we mixed up all these remedies with with things like celandine and lard. We'd got them all in pots, and members of the public came in and uh, and and gave them a try. And I'll always remember that I went to um, Hillard's in York a few days later, uh, and I met a woman there who said, "Oh." you're the person who made up all those Anglo-Saxon remedies, aren't you? And I said, oh. yes. And she said, well, you gave me a remedy for mistiness of the eye. And I've been suffering terribly with my eyes recently, but now they've completely cleared. So I always say that, uh, you know, she was, she was my first successful yes. patient that I ever treated. <laughs> and like you say, when you've got um, no one to guide you into what kind of when you're when you're interested in herbs and herb law and herb history you guided yourself Val you 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 were that passionate about it that it was something you could not let go absolutely <laughs> and uh, I mean I, I did become an English teacher but uh, but I, I'd only done that for about four years and, uh, and and I thought I wanted something more exciting so <laughs> so I ran away to Scandinavia um, oh wonderful and, uh, and I, I lived in Sweden for seven years. And while I was there, I met this amazing cunning man called Jester Wilson. And he was a herbalist and he used only the herbs and plants that he found in the forest around his little cottage where wow. he lived. Yeah. So yeah. He, he didn't import anything. It was just what he picked and what he dried himself. Yes. Um, yeah. And he taught me lots about about foraging and about using herbs medicinally. He wasn't particularly interested in the magical uses of herbs, but, uh, but the medicinal uses he was very keen on. So I learned a lot from him. And then when I came back from Sweden, I, I just practiced herbalism in, in a kind of folk herbalist sort of way. Mm -hmm. So I didn't have any, any qualifications, but I just treated myself and you know, friends and, and family a little bit. Um, and of course, I, I used to talk to people about using herbs and, yes. Uh, yes. and, and I did a few little, little courses for people connected with Norwich Pagan Moot about using herbs you know, just to make, make potions and magical filters and, and things like that. It reached a, a point when I was, I was about 45 at the time, and I had a very intense weekend of magic and herbs. And when I got to the end of that, that amazing weekend, I suddenly realised that 
I had to somehow find the money and the time to do formal training to become a medical herbalist. Then I went to do a, a, a proper degree course in herbal medicine. And I finally qualified with a degree in herbal medicine just about on my 50th birthday. Hurrah! That's awesome. And because and, um, I was going to ask, actually, I've got a wee friend. She is just turned teenage and she said, yeah, I'd like to work with herbs, actually. I'd like to be a herbalist. How do I do that? And I said, do you know what, So. I'm going to talk to the mighty Val. So, uh, but, you know, <laughs> so yeah, age 13, if she no, if someone knows where they want to go now, how can, how can you help guide them, Val? What would be their first step? Well, I, I suppose, you know, they, they, it would be great if they could find somebody to work with who uh, would, would, would help them and, and teach them a little bit that they could be doing, um, safely because obviously you know you, you wouldn't want to, to let a 13 year old loose on on some of the herbs and plants that um, you could potentially use and you'd want to be absolutely sure that if they were picking things um, that they were correctly identified and, and safe and, and so on. It, depending on where she lived, you know, it would be possible if, if you looked up a, a herbalist on the um, National Institute of Medical Herbalists website, for example, she could find a herbalist who was living near to her and, and perhaps that herbalist would be prepared to, to meet her and spend a little time giving her some guidance. But I would also say, uh, as, as well as looking into the herbal side of things, that, you know, focusing on subjects like biology and chemistry at school would then stand her in very good stead because you need to know how the human body works. Mm. You need to know your botany mm. and you also need to know your phytochemistry, which is what the chemical constituents are within the herbs that you're using. Thank you. That's awesome. I'm totally passing that on to her. She'll love that. So as part of your um, herb work, Val, you have linked to historical herbs used, for example, from the Anglo-Saxon time, which is something obviously that interests me greatly. And I would love to know how that compares with something that you might do nowadays. Massive okay. question. <laughs> that is quite a big question. But, but once, once you start to go through the, the Anglo-Saxon text, and, and what's amazing about Anglo-Saxon herbal medicine is that they have left us with over a thousand manuscript pages of, of medical text. That is and, amazing. Yeah, I mean, it, it's it's a lot to, to, to still have from such a long time ago. I mean, sadly, so, some, some of it's damaged and obviously, um, you know, during the Reformation and, uh, and, mm. and the dissolution of the monasteries where most of these texts were kept, you know, a lot of, a lot of other texts must have been destroyed. One of the first things that you read in the old English herbarium for example uh, is, is, a, is, a, is a whole section which is slightly separate from the main text which is all about the herb betony, Stachys platonica. One of the first things it says is that you know this, this, this herb is used for headaches and that's exactly the same use that we would have for Bethany today. Another great example, white whorehound and elecampane, yes, yes. because these, these are both herbs that are used e extensively in Anglo-Saxon medicine, but mainly for coughs and colds. And that's, again, exactly how you would use those today. White whorehound is really good for a dry cough where people are, you know, are, are, are finding it you know, perhaps you know, difficult to stop coughing, but they're not really bringing up any mucus or anything like that. Which is just, it just blows my mind that they understood which part of the body it could help they, and yes. how it would help, but maybe not why. You know, we don't, we don't know that they didn't understand why. I mean, the, the um, Leech Book 2 of the Leech Book 
of bold. It, you know, it has a, a quite detailed explanation, for example, of of the function of the liver and the function of the spleen. It's not that far different from our own understanding. So, so you know, I I, I think we shouldn't underestimate uh, how much. Uh, the Anglo-Saxons understood about these things. For example, uh, elderberries, which mm -hmm. have been used for centuries for treating uh, viral infections, coughs, colds, particularly good for winter colds. You know, more recent scientific research has demonstrated that the berries and the flowers as well do have antiviral properties. My friend Fiona, she will get elderberries reduce them and put them in freezer trays so that each little elderberry compote kind of square yeah. she'll, she'll put it in um, a, a winter stew or soup mm. so that yeah that over the winter she's having the elderberry all the way through and she swears by it well yes that's perfect because you're getting just the right sort of amount of of, of antiviral uh medication to help maintain good health and they contain yeah. antioxidants as well, which is which is very useful. You know, so, so yeah. some of the herbs we used uh, we use now are, are quite well researched scientifically, but there are plenty of other herbs where we just go on the traditional uses, and uh, and there's not a vast amount of scientific research and uh, clinical studies being being done on the herbs. So, you know. We, we think maybe the Anglo-Saxons didn't know exactly how all the herbs work, but, but we don't know either. And it's nice that, you know, there's a little bit of mystery still about it, isn't there? <laughs> you know, herbal practitioners range from, you know, you know atheist and hardline scientific to to uh people with a more magical approach and and, and different herbalists mm -hmm. suit different patients as you can imagine i'm quite interested in how your heritage crafting links to paganism because i find a lot of people who do spinning weaving naturally dying uh, have also have some pagan belief core beliefs as well do you think there's like a link between doing something that has been done for thousands of years and having that rooted belief that has been believed for thousands of years do you see what I mean yeah, I mean, yeah absolutely yeah I think you're absolutely right Jenny it, it, it really does um I mean one one of the first kind of magical practices that that I started to learn was with spinning and you know I came into spinning in a magical way because it was oh, go again, on. Go on. I, I'd seen a picture in 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 um the Golden Hands Encyclopedia of Crafts from the seventies, oh. um, which which because I I, I liked crafts, my, my father very kindly bought me these um, these journals which came out each week, and I remember seeing a picture of somebody uh, in one of these issues who was sitting there spinning, and I was I looked at it and I thought I really want to do that. I had no real possibility of doing that. You know, I, I, I couldn't have asked my parents to buy me a spinning wheel and they probably wouldn't have even known where to look for one if, if they'd have had the money to do that. After I left York University, I went to live in Cardiff. That's where I did my teacher training. And I was walking in a country park in South Glamorgan, just outside Cardiff. And I came across this little cottage, a tiny kind of Welsh stone cottage with a thatched roof. It was all whitewashed on the outside. And I went in there and there was a woman sitting there spinning. And I was like, oh, my goodness, you know, this is real. This isn't just the stuff of, of, of yeah. fairy tales and, and, and pretty pictures in, in craft books. This, this is for real. And I talked to her and it turned out that she was Margaret Hansford who was the president of the uh, Federation of yes. Spinners, Weavers and Dyers. Oh, yes. 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 Uh, and so I said, oh, I've always wanted to do this. And she said, well, funnily enough, I'm running a course starting next week. And as soon as I started to do it, you know, I, I kind of felt that, um, you know, connection with the past and, and, and with the ancestors, but also that, absolute joy of taking materials from the source mm. and then creating something 
you know, usable, wearable and beautiful as well. You do it all yourself. Oh, wonderful. Well, I've, well, Val, I'm right at the start of this journey. And yes, um, so I, last year I joined the Mid-Norfolk Guild of Weavers, Spinners and Dyers. And they're such a lovely group of ladies and they're very patient. And I've got Shetland and um, some Portland, Jacobs. And I'm just, I just need to practice more, but it sort of thrills me and terrifies me. And Sure you will. I mean, it's, it's, all, it's, all, it's all about practice, isn't it? But the great thing yeah. about spinning is that, that you can combine your spinning, um, you know, with, with with meditation and spell work because the rhythm of the spinning is is very very meditative. For me, it's one of the things that kind of transports me into that almost trance like state, uh, in in which you can have magical revelations and you know find out things about the past and also do spell work and of course you know this the spun thread is the perfect spell isn't it because all of your intention you can put into the thread as you're spinning it and then of course there are so many traditional thread and knot spells that it's possible to use with the yarn that you've spun yourself this is amazing. I, I have heard about, um, the, you know, the ladies do say, from the Guild, do say um, it, it is addictive. Oh, it's, it's meditative. Addictive. All these kinds of things. Yeah. I mean, one of, one of the first kind of spells that I ever did for other people, I would spin the yarn and, and, and make hats with crochet, crocheted hats. They were. <laughs> and I always said to people, if you wear this hat, Whenever you go out in the winter, you won't get a cold this winter. And and people often said, oh, you know, I I, I wore your hat. And, and actually, I didn't come to think of it, I didn't get a cold. So that worked well. Oh, gosh, I love that so much. <laughs> well, we need to get spinning, Val. This is what you're telling me, right? I need to do this a lot. Well, the, the, thing, the thing is, one, once you get to the point where you feel you can do it easily, you know, you, you can do all sorts of other things while, while you're spinning. The process is very relaxing and, you know, you can, you can think about things. You could probably even record podcasts and spin at the same time. Wow. Just a gentle whirring in the yes. background. And did, did you know, Jenny, that the, um, the word in, in Swedish for spin, the verb is spinna, and that is the same word that you use for the purring of a cat. I love that because yeah. that's also been um, proved, isn't it? That the, about how the the frequency of the cat's purr is actually a soothing, healing frequency for humans. Yes, and it's very much connected with the sound of the spinning wheel and with the magic of the spinning wheel. So, Val, coming from Norfolk, um, some of your writings are based on some of the core elements that are to do with Norfolk, like the flint and the chalk. I've now lived in Norfolk for almost 30 years. I've made such wonderful connections here. and I, I've worked so much interesting and powerful magic here with people that, you know, I wanted to write a book that was really a celebration of the magic and my involvement with it over the years. And one of the things that, that we always did, or still do, in fact, in, in, in our magical group, was to, to think about you know, the, the deities who are really local to the area. The goddess is Our Lady of the Chalk, because the chalk underlies most of the county, and that's what informs everything that, that grows and flourishes here. So yeah. you know, the plants that, that grow are, are the ones that, you know, that like that kind of a, the yes. Yes. Um, And obviously, you know, chalk is, is very important for, for putting on the fields to condition them for growing the crops. So it's very, very much about growth. So we see the lady of the chalk, you know, as, as a goddess who, who nurtures and nourishes the county. And, and if, you, if you go to, to Sheringham or West Runton, you can actually stand on the beach. And as the tide goes out, you can watch the Lady of the Chalk stepping out of the sea. I mean, it is such a wonderful thing to, to watch. 
and and of course you know, the, the flint is is something that you find everywhere. I mean, you know, Norfolk is full of the flint buildings, isn't it? Um, yes, I and, absolutely uh, adore uh, that about where yeah. we live because yeah, 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 other places don't have the benefit of um, flint covered churches and buildings and walls and it's a it's a real feature of of the county, isn't it? And and it's so important. And of course, the way the flint is produced, you you can see it as as being you know, born of the chalk. So it's it's like, you know, the, the, the chalk goddess, she is like the mother who gives birth to the to the flint lord. He's there in our buildings. So he's he's a protector of hearth and home. He's also a very spiritual being because there he is in all the churches. But he, he's also a hunter and a warrior because in Neolithic time, the Stone Age before that, you know, the, the, the arrows were all flint tipped weren't they so of course. Uh, well, we've got evidence of that in Grimes Graves in Norfolk yes that's the most wonderful place you know if if you want to make that real contact um with the Lord of Norfolk and those kind of ancient forces of of, of stone age people you know and, and and the powers that were there it's it's a it's a fantastic place to visit, and and I have on several occasions um, climbed right down into the one pit there that is open, yes. and, and that it is possible to go into. And you go down, down, down on this tiny yeah. Yeah. ladder, yeah. which is just metal, and and the rungs get colder and colder <laughs> as you go down yeah. Yeah. into the mine. Um, you know, and you see all the different kinds of flint in, in the wall as you go down and then when you get to the bottom you see this amazing uh, black floor stone which is what people were, were digging the mines to get at it really is a, a sacred place and, and I think it's also fascinating that um, you know Grimes graves uh, su suggests that people have associated the area with Odin or Woden and that, uh, you know, a, a later emanation of deity uh, ha, ha, has also become attached to, to, to that place of such ancient sacredness. I've looked at some of the really popular sacred places in Norfolk, places like Wayland Wood and, and mm -hmm. Foxton Wood, um, you know, Warham Camp near Wells, which is that amazing uh, Iron Age mm. fort. Oh, I've also talked about the Witch's Leg at, um, at, at Somerton, you know, which is an yes. amazing yes. place, isn't it? Yes. Would you um, give a tiny little bit on the Witch's Leg, the witch, please, Val? About the Witch's Leg? Yes. Um, yes. In the village... There was a witch who, for some reason, managed to make herself unpopular. She was taken and, and buried underneath the, the floor of the church. But it just so happened that she had a wooden leg. How she came by her wooden leg is not explained in the story. But uh, to avenge herself against the villagers who had, had killed her and buried her under the church floor, she kicked out with this wooden leg and it turned into an oak tree, which then destroyed the whole of the church. And that oak tree is still growing in the ruins of the church today. And you can you can go there and uh, and see it. And it's it, it it's the, a place that looks as if it, it should be um, you know in a, in a kind of gothic horror movie. Absolutely does. It, yeah, it, the tales do not do it justice. Well, yes, and and what you can do if 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 you want to release the spirit of of the witch, you walk round the tree three times, and say round and round the sacred tree, set the witch's spirit free. Then then you can release her spirit and learn something from her. It is quite a dark and, and difficult energy, and and I don't yes. recommend. Uh, you know, picking up any stones or anything from there and bringing them back into your house because, it, you know, it's quite a dark energy. But there's nevertheless a lot that can be learned from there. Absolutely. It's been so nice to connect, Val. I've yeah, it's really lovely this. to talk to you. And maybe I will <laughs> message you <laughs> some pictures of my spinning when I get somewhere. Oh, with yes, that. please do. <laughs> that, I mean that 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 would be lovely, and hopefully, you know, we'll we'll be able, you know we can meet up somewhere. 
once yes. we're allowed to meet people again. I'd love that. I would really love that, Val. We could go on a, a gathering walk. Let's do that. I'd love that. Yeah, or how about this? I've, I've got this brilliant idea now. Let's do Why it. don't we both take our spinning wheels to the witch's leg and sit in that church and spin oh. in, in the by, by the witch's leg? Okay, can I take all my crystals with me for protection? <laughs> Uh, I do that, please. Actually, oh no, I better not because they might absorb the energy. Oh gosh. Yeah, you don't. You won't need them. It'll be fine. Okay. If you're with me, I completely trust you. Val. <laughs> I wouldn't do it on my own. So, <laughs> she might help me. Actually, it might get better. Well, exactly. Right. Yes, we're doing that, Val. Wow. Ooh. Yeah. I know if we yeah, could record that's... the podcast from there. Thanks so much for asking me, Jenny, and oh, uh, I a... look forward to seeing you soon. Absolute pleasure. Take care, Val. Look after yourself. Meet the Makers. I'm joined now by Fee from Dancing Magpie, artiste, creator extraordinaire. Hi, Fee. Hi, <laughs> And we first came into contact through uh, reenactment in a way because mm. we did a little trader swap, which I love doing. You wanted a belt. I thought that's doable. And then I thought oh, I could really do with a logo. And I really love the process you took me through, Fee, from an initial thought to doing some research that you did on rune stones and things like that to really help me come up with a logo that was dragony, rune stony, viking and yet all mine, which I love. <laughs> <laughs> it's not the gelling dragon, it's the Jenny dragon. <laughs> How long have you been an artist, Fee? Forever and ever and ever and ever and ever, much to the horror of my school teachers. That's a long time. <laughs> yeah, no, what it was, I was I was that weird kid at school, you know, the one at the back of the class that doesn't speak and yeah. looks a bit strange um, and might do stuff outside of school that other people don't do. And I was the kid that doodled in my English book. In fact, my English teacher, I remember sitting there, and she caught me drawing horses in the margin of my back of my book. And that was in the days when teachers would slap you and she slapped me on the back of the head with a ruler Ooh. and said, stop doing that, blah, 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 whatever she said. You will never get anywhere by drawing horses. Um, which later the years down the line, I was making a living being a pet portrait artist, did kind of make me laugh. <laughs> Prove the teacher's wrong. That's right. Well, that's the, that's the thing, isn't it? But um, I've just always had to draw or paint or just make things and I think it's just something that you're born with really and then it, it depends on how far you know you choose to push it but I just I mean if, if I have any sort of mark making tool in my hand at all I'm constantly just doodling and I'll doodle on anything and everything and then I think over the years the doodles just turned into sort of bigger and bigger <laughs> yeah we, we met because of tablet weaving I, I decided that one of my reenactment characters um needed to cross over from the dark ages because I do viking reenactment with the unknown vikings in chester and i wanted to have a kit that would cross over between viking um sort of dark ages and um iron age and i knew that tablet weaving did that because there'd been evidence of it being found um you'll know better than me uh, yeah. oh where, where was it well um, is the iron the, age one yeah. from yeah austria yeah the whole stat stuff yeah. yeah, so that's you know, that's why I asked you to do what you were doing. And then when you mentioned looking for a logo, I was like, hmm, that's doable. <laughs> I've always sort of liked kind of print work and stuff. I did printing briefly when I was at art college. The um, gelling dragon, but Jenny's dragon, yeah. <laughs> happened because um, when you were saying about what you did and that you sort of predominantly Viking age and that, that sort of style and the rune style, um, that lends itself really, really well to print work because think about how the runes themselves are created, they're carved into stone or they're carved into wood and they're straight lines because people are carving them. So from a print point of view, they're absolutely ideal because they're really simple to carve, um, but you have to carve everything in reverse. So when I was doing your logo, I had, had to write it and then reverse it to carve it. So then when the print block's printed, it comes back you know, the right way around because that would be quite interesting trying to read runes backwards. Uh, and the dragon, because obviously you, you said that, you know, you wanted something dragony and mm. or something that's completely yours. Yes. And was sort of a mixture of sort of the, the gelling dragon type stone carvings. Um, and I just had a really nice time actually looking at the rune stones. Oh, what should we pinch from there? Should... And part of the creative method is to go through, you, you take the client's brief, 
and what that person particularly wants and I discuss that with them and then sort of pick your way through things that they might like I think I asked you for examples of what you liked mm. and then you have a little look at that and you just kind of sort of bring it all together and then you have sort of various different designs and then you, you know, as we did you know talk through with that and say do you like this what don't you like about that and then the idea is it that you work together as a, a sort of working team to create you know, the end piece, which is, you know, hopefully, you know, that people enjoy having. So the whole sort of print process is, when you think about it, actually very, very basic, really simple. And there's examples of it, sort of the Neolithic art. So you have the last co, I think it's last co, with the hand prints on the wall. Oh, yes. Yeah. Yeah. So it's probably sort of the first one print, isn't it, where some human has gone and coded their hand in whatever the paint would have been. Um, and then just put the hand on the wall. And they think about how small children react around paint. They paddle their hands around in the paint, and then they'll just like barely paint on the wallpaper or, you know, the carpet or anywhere else. But it's sort of, it seems like a human need to mark make. And then I think as you sort of start to think a little bit more or just play around with what tools you've got, you know, then that expands into other mark making. You know, so you look at sort of the history of prints, it's gone from, you know, the hand prints. And you, you think about sort of, even when people have made the wax seals, you know, the seal rings for uh, sealing letters up, you know, that's another, it's not printing, but it's still, you have this um, raised relief design, you then press it into the wax to create that mark. And it's exactly the same process. Uh, and then it, you know, it's, it's, you can sort of see how it's evolved. And then of course you have that, you know, the invention of the printing press and terms we get from printing like upper and lowercase text because on the letter press, which is the, the type of press that you use to, yes. to obviously type out, print out books, um, you have the uppercase boxes, which have all the capital letters, and the lowercase boxes, which have the lowercase letters. Wow, fact drops, so love it. <laughs> that's where that phrase comes from. And so does mind your P's and Q's. Because if you can imagine in those boxes, the cases where the letters are, all the letters are in reverse, they're all backwards. So the P and the Q in reverse look basically the same. So it's mind make, making sure when you're setting up for the letterpress, that your P and your Q is actually not mixed up. So that's where the phrase mind your P's and Q's comes from. <laughs> Loving that. I'd like to pick up on what you said about mark making and humans always wanting to leave a little something. And when it's um, looking at far back archaeology, I guess we're still wondering why they've made these marks hmm. and why they've left something in that particular place. So interesting. You talked about cave paintings there as well. Yeah, I think, I think what happens is when I've noticed sort of this with working with children, young children up until sort of early teens think they're invincible. They haven't met death yet. And it, it doesn't occur to them that perhaps one day they actually physically won't exist anymore. They won't be yeah. there. And I think if you sort of look at that as being ancestral development from sort of early the sort of first humanids up till now, if you look at that sort of through, I suppose, almost at the pagan concept of the age of you know, life evolving and sort of the life periods. So, you know, sort of early man is like childhood and then blah, blah, blah. And we go on through history. So I think sort of with the mark making, it's almost like, you know, humans start off going, yes, we're invincible. Oh, someone just died. <laughs> it's, how do we sort of make what we want to say last or how do we leave you know, we, we talk about making your mark on the world yeah. you know it's another sort of phrase that just pops up isn't it and I think we just want to make something to remember the folk people to remember us by perhaps people even documenting what went on perhaps it's, it's even just bored kids it's pouring down outside we've got the ice age you can't go out to play you're going to die of hyperthermia <laughs> turtle fall off stay in the back of the cave and here's some red ochre off you go so you know maybe we're all going oh these sacred cave paintings yes aren't that at all perhaps it's you know kids doodling on the cave yes. wall to keep them quiet a lockdown <laughs> in the cave here <laughs> humans as a, a creature want to seem to leave some sort of decoration some sort of mark and, and that also translates from just being you know like the aboriginal rock art right across the world you know from australia right through to this country you know, every bit of rock that can be carved onto, painted onto, you know, and probably trees as well, because they've rotted where we don't know. You know, it's, it's humans want to make marks and, and make memories, but then that also translates into things like tattoos and body art. Yes. And then that probably goes on to textiles and textile patterns. And you can say so much visually, you know, you can sort of delineate your tribal boundary or, 
your own, you know, if you think about sort of style and fashion now, you know, so I, I grew up through sort of um, the 80s heavy metal thing. And I had sort of back home, bright purple spiky hair and black eyeliner and multiple piercings and a black bike jacket that I painted an Iron Maiden patch on the back of it. <laughs> and my friends, my tribe all looked like that. We all had our ripped jeans and our studded belts. We listened to heavy metal, you know, went to all these biker rock clubs. But we were like a tribe. And, it, you know, go to like Donington Monster of Rock as it was, you know. And we'd all be the tribe. We'd all look the same. And I can remember being in a, a really horrible gungy nightclub in Birkenhead once watching a band. And I don't know why, but the bouncers let in um, a couple of lads who were wearing shell suits, who were you know, ravers. And immediately everyone turned around and stared at them because they didn't have long hair and bike jackets and piercings and tattoos, you know. And these two lads, to this day, I have no idea why the bouncers let them in. Um, just to me, it disappeared underneath a, a pile of bikers. Oh, no. They were you know, sort of again with sort of textile. <laughs> <laughs> with the textile marks and things, the textile patterns, they can be quite geographically sort of very localised. And I think maybe, you know, sort of I was talking to somebody about medieval wimples and how people wear their hair fastened up underneath, you know, how people cover their hair. And it seems that, you know, even from village to village, there may have been a different way of just tying a knot in a piece of cloth so that, you know, your hair is worn in a certain way. You know, your hair, your veil is covering in a certain way or, you know, perhaps even, you know, sort of fabric colours because in that area it's e pretty easy to get a certain plant or a certain mm. mineral to make a dye so it's prevalent in that area and I just think every like art and history is just intrinsically tied together you can't really unravel it you know and it's also the arts and sciences are also tied up together and it's just it's a vast vast but fascinating subject and I get really nerdy about it and other people kind of glaze over and try and sidle out in the room well, um, can we talk about your love of horses? Would that be oh, awesome? God, that is that is an obsession. I think horses were one of the first things I began drawing when I was a kid. And I, I grew up originally, we came from Cumbria and lived in a, a, a tiny little farming community. And a friend of mine had a little dinky black shell pony, a fell pony. Um, he seemed huge to me at the time. He was probably only about 12 hands, which is quite small in horse world. And he was called Strewy. And we used to go down to the orchard where he lived in with nothing but a head cover and a rope and catch this pony and then just climb on his back and amble around. I think actually he was doing the ambling. We just did the sitting. I don't think there was any riding really involved. <laughs> he was very patient. Looking back, that pony was a saint. <laughs> <laughs> but also one of the things that I remember about living in Cumbria was you'd see the fell ponies up on the fells and they'd be galloping across the side of the fell. And just that image of these ponies, these like semi-wild ponies, just, just galloping. And it's a really magical image. And then you get the white horse roughing turn and the whole sort of, there's a whole mythological aspect of horses as well. Um, and also possibly linked to things like dragons and stuff. And if you look at the white horse roughing turn, it doesn't really look quite like a horse. Yes, agreed. Yes. It's a something, but I don't know what, what it is. It's not quite horse and not quite dragon. So maybe it's kind of mixed together. But the whole horse thing, I worked as a riding instructor as well for a number of years and had a, a Welsh cob who taught me a lot about gravity. He was very good at physics. <laughs> and I learned that humans aren't great at flying. Oh. But uh, we came to an arrangement and we got on the right after that. <laughs> but um, I think horses are either something you love or something you loathe. And... I, mean, I know plenty of people like them on the side of a fence, but I just I can't help drawing them. I just draw them incessantly. But yeah, it's, it's that sort of movement and that freedom. But again, um, I think it's that, that sort of historical link because if you think about where we are now, we wouldn't have got to where we are now without the horse mm. because you know, the horse is vitally important for our ancestors, starting off being a food product, you know, and using the bone and the hide and what have you to make things. Um, and then learning how to ride them and tame them. And, you know, the horses have taken us to war. Horses have pulled plows. You know, the horses have shifted narrow boats. They, you know, pretty much anything you can think of that needed moving, a horse, you know, at some point has done that. And then, of course, you know, come the, the Industrial Revolution, then you sort of look at more mechanical things. Horses get superseded. But I think we still, as a people, have a love of horses. And, you know, most people have this either a romantic idea about them or, you know, They'll see horses in a the field and they want to go and pet them. But yeah, they're, they're just one of those things, really. And they're just sort of, yeah, obsessive over them. 
Let's go on to your latest cards. So uh, I've noticed a seasonal aspect to your making as well, Fee. Because yeah. You had the most gorgeous Jack hair for Valentine's Day. And the way his missus looked at him, <laughs> the expression you had in that the female hair's eyes to look at Jack, I thought, oh, I mean, talk about doughy eyed. Yeah, Jack hair. So okay, I, I, I normally in, in other life, pre-COVID life, would have been traveling around in combination of reenactment and also working at music festivals. I normally do face painting at festivals and I'm also a, do a bit of character acting. I have a character called Theodora Bagwitch. Um, who <laughs> who sells spells that may or may not, and she's she's quite rude um, in a very family PC kind of way. But um, yeah, well, so I'm Theodora is currently all her clothes in my cupboard. Yeah, <laughs> she's t- temporarily unemployed. <laughs> um, but the the Jack Hare character and all the other animals are based on sort of people that I've, I've met along the way, festival people and performance people, because just through doing what I've always done. I know a lot of people who are circus performers, you know, and people who are character performers at festivals. And also, you know, with, with reenactment, you have that moment at the end of the day where you're sitting around that fire or chatting and having a bit of a drink and, you know, and just having a laugh. Yeah. Uh, and I miss it. You really know what it's like, you know, that, that thing where we all travel along together, we get to a place, we build up our camp, we, you know, we put our tents up, we get all our stuff out, we get our kit on, you know, and we go out and we do our stuff. And in the day we sit around and, it's a whole social side of it. Community, isn't um, it? It's a different community. It is a huge, it's, it's, it's a wonderful community. And I just really, really miss it. And then I don't know why I just began drawing this Hare, who was sort of like a showman character. And I have no idea really where Jack Hare came from. It just kind of popped into my head. And then I began to sort of think about it. And I thought, oh, yeah, we could have this entire troop of animals that are doing all the things that my friends do. <laughs> So there are some reenactment ones coming up as well. Ooh, awesome. <laughs> because I'm also, I think I mentioned Park in the Past to you before. It's an amazing project over by Wrexham. Uh, and it's owned and run by a guy called Paul Harston, who has Chester Roman Tours. And they're, they're building a full-sized Roman fort on there. And one of the things they want to do working with them is to produce a series of artwork of sort of reenactment animals so sort of animals in Roman uniform or animals you know in the same way that Jack Hare is you know and 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 do that and sort of see where that goes really but um yeah it is it's about that sort of family and that performance and and that fun and that slightly sort of wild thing that goes on I'm not quite sure how you term it really you know sort of it's, it's like sort of edge living you know you know when you go reenact in a castle and the tourists come around during the day and everyone behaves themselves <laughs> because we're there you know, to, to be our reenactment selves and, and, and give people a good day out and good course, experience. Yes, yes. And then as soon as they've gone, the anarchy kind of kicks off. <laughs> yeah. And it's not even like, you know, because uh, there are obviously boundaries. No one would ever dare to upset castle walls or do something. You know, we, we feel yeah. the privilege of being there. What the yeah. anarchy is, is with each other. Yeah. yeah. And messing oh, yeah. around and playing games and yeah. It's, it's that laughter and that camaraderie. I mean, one year at Beaumaris Castle, when I was there years ago, they've got these amazing big floodlights. And we discovered if we stood on one of the, the outer wall, we could do like a YMCA <laughs> reflection of the shadow on the inside one. So all this bunch of reenactors in a line <laughs> doing the whole YMCA thing. And it was just, we were killing ourselves laughing at the time uh, and uh, just running around the castle and, and, and just sort of meeting other groups who were camped in there, you know, and just having those fires and the food and a bit of mead going around. And, and it's that, like you say, we do respect where we are. You know, it's, it's, it's a huge privilege. I go to this castle mm. and go, yes, this castle's my holiday home. <laughs> <laughs> you know, how wonderful is that? But it's, it's that group thing and that laughter and that, that magic. And it's that sort of, and you, you get it as well when you, you're at festivals and, and anywhere there's performers, it's this kind of wildness. And it's, it's, it's not, a, you know, not about being annoying or angering people. It's just that laughter you have amongst each other and that, you know, sort of taking the proverbial out of each other and long running jokes that, you know, you keep going from for months after you know, sort of meet people and you make a game of circuit and a joke reappears and it's like, oh, no, not again. Yeah, not that. <laughs> oh, no. I wish I never had. No, I think with the wildness is, is almost an, an aspect of um, 
the rules of your normal day life don't apply. You don't have mm. to go to work. You don't have to pay a bill. You don't have to go to the shop. You don't have to fill up with petrol. All of that is just to the side. So, yeah, the wildness is maybe like a return to something that we are ancestral together, mm. round the fire, things like that. Yeah, so I remember sitting in the, one of the towers at Beaumaris where we had our, our kitchen and we had the fire, we'd move the firebox in the middle of it, all sat in a circle around it. And I remember looking up now, there's just this like circular cutout of stars above us wow. and the smoke eddying up, you know, and that light from the fire and just of people's voices and somebody was singing and I just remember like this sort of, just looking up the stars and going, oh my God, <laughs> I'm alive, it's amazing. <laughs> I love it how it would have been wouldn't it it was literally like you are transported back when it goes calm yeah. of an evening I was going to say as well talking about being in castles at night time sometimes it can freak me out a little bit because it's not normal no, well not for me anyway <laughs> <laughs> it's your one chance you don't get these chances normally do you at reenactment yeah. you see behind the curtain you you're allowed in places where public aren't usually allowed to yeah. go and we miss it so much Definitely. That's that's kind of what Jack Hare is. He's, he's sort of today from the workshop. <laughs> today, <laughs> can you see that? Oh yes, gorgeous. It's Jack Hare and Co on their horse. The horse is actually my old horse Ben, um, and he's travelling to his show. And I, I painted it. And went, oh my god, <laughs> I want to do that. But that's the. It's going to be a greetings card. That's the name of my next job. But yeah, so it's, it's, it's about that sort of travelling and that family and, you know, the sort of festival family, the reenactment family, not necessarily your own personal family. But... The camaraderie as well at an event, whether it's a festival or a reenactment, is you almost instantly know you can trust that person because you have to. Because you know that um, if you're struggling with something or something happens that you need someone to help you with immediately or something's happened with another reenactor or a member of the public, you just have to rely on each other straight away. If I was a member of public waffling around and something was going on, I'd think, oh, someone else will deal with it. But suddenly <laughs> when you're the people there, you've got that close knitness to, to help each other. When things go really right, really wrong, or whatever happens, it's just that yeah, dependency on people that you've never met before, which is quite amazing, really. It is, yeah. And I think that's something I've noticed both in reenactment world and also in the sort of festival crew world as well. And it, you do, you become a sort of traveling family and you, you might not see each other the best part of a year, depending on wherever you're looking, you know, where you end up with locations. And then suddenly they're going, Oh my God, how is it? You know, and you get talking to people and yeah, it is, it's a funny, it's a very sort of transient thing, but at the same time, it's, it's got this sort of permanence. I think it, it, it does answer that whatever it is in us that wants to time travel and we have this romanticised idea of the past. And I can remember a lady saying to me at one of the events I did, oh, you know, I bet you, you wish you were born, you know, in the 1300s. I said, actually, no, I'm really quite glad that I wasn't. <laughs> because when you actually look at the reality of the time periods that we reenact, you know, at, at the end of a day, if we're cold and wet and our tent's fallen down, you know what, we can get in the car and we can go home. <laughs> Um, we're not going to die of bubonic plague because we have access to antibiotics we yeah. hope yes. um, you know if we need to go to hospital you know we're not going to have our hand chopped off while we're still conscious and dunked in some boiling tar or something like that and it's like no I'm really happy that I'm living in this century but mm. that I have that freedom and that ability you know to go and basically play in other time periods and also to share that sort of love of it with other people and that's a really good point about not looking at the past nostalgically. Mm. This was a, rea a grim reality. And, you know, but the fact that a lot of people, it happens with every generation, no matter who it is. Oh, in our day, la la la. Well, yes, quite frankly, maybe yes. But in the children today, we'll look back and go in our day to, the, yeah. to their grandchildren. It's just how it changes in the generations, isn't it? Yeah, I think we forget the grim bits. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> So I was talking to my daughter about the miners' strikes. And, oh, yeah, I remember the miners' strikes and, and those, yeah, the power cuts. And my mum was cooking tins of beans over the hearth in the front room because that was the only thing she could cook on. <laughs> oh, I forgot about that. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. When I first joined the Vikings, I really wasn't sure because I knew nothing about Vikings. I mean, partly joined them out of curiosity and they seemed like a nice bunch of people, but they actually still are a nice bunch of people. Yeah. But when I first joined, I had this idea of like I was going to be some sort of Viking character. 
um, and the group suggested me being a vulva because I have an interest Ooh. in sort of the cult and that sort of side of things. And I looked at it and I thought, well, we're sort of 10th century Britain. What actually would have happened? Was like, okay, the vulvas had been and done and gone by that point in time. And then I began to look at leech people, cunning people. Ooh. And it's an absolutely fascinating subject. And I decided that my character would be Anglo-Saxon just to annoy the other Vikings. <laughs> I was like, no, I'm going to be the Thor on your side. You invaded my country. Oh, yes, I'm going to never let you forget that. <laughs> right? <laughs> I'm the annoying Saxon in our group. And um, but I began to read things like the Latin Unger and Ball's Leech book um, and Herbarium. <laughs> and I'm not a herbalist by a long shot, but it's an absolutely fascinating subject. And I, I discovered that People have this idea about witchcraft and witches sort of through history and witchcraft persecution and all that kind of thing. And just from reading um, about what Alfred the Great said about witches and Saxon people, women in that time period, again, same as with Viking societies, did actually have a, uh, the ability to have the same social status as men. So women could own property, you know, women could get divorced. Um, women could also, you know, arrange marriages and that kind of thing were also going on, but women weren't just, you know, like a subclass. Mm. And it did depend on what your social class was as to how you were treated as a woman as well. So if you're a serf, it's just tough, really. But the more I began to look at sort of the magical aspect of that time period, the more, well, the less magic there actually is. The church are doing magic. The church, on the other hand, will say to you, if you're somebody who has a child of fever, and you put that child on your house roof or in the oven to try and cure this fever. <laughs> the church views this as idolatry. And so they will put a penitential on you. And there's a, one of the penitentials for doing that, I, I think it's 12 months of just bread and water. So the church actually say, oh, you've been very naughty in doing something you shouldn't have done. Here, you have to fast and just have bread and water. And that's as, as strict as the church gets when it comes to witchcraft. But the, the putting a child on the roof in the oven actually makes sense from a healing point of view, because if someone has a fever, you either want to heat them up um, because that will help the fever to break or cool them down. So if you imagine the roof actually is a little tiny low thatch building, it's not what you know, we have now. So plonking a child where the wind is blowing to cool it down actually does make sense. But somehow the church views that as being idolatry. I'm not quite sure how, you know, put my child on the roof and pray maybe I don't know <laughs> Today. but but the um leech people um were not viewed as witches at all they're viewed as doctors and paid as such and it seemed that they were training that the leeches were training the monks and vice versa and some leeches actually working within the monastic communities and the secular community at the same time so it's, it's been really interesting just exploring that and then having to make all the stuff mm. I found um <clears throat> there's absolutely no written evidence at all of female leeches so I might actually be way off the mark with that but it doesn't mean they didn't exist because there are graves that have turned up they've had incredible grave finds and there's there's a grave that's got tiny little buckets there's nine buckets that may have been attached to a bag and they can't work out whether they're attached inside or outside um, but these buckets have little bits of thread inside them um, and some seeds sort of vegetable matter and they don't quite know what they were but they, they've also found another grave thing called pixies which appear to also have the same sort of vegetable matter and threads. And they're wondering if they're like tiny... Um, like a relic kind of thing. Uh, yeah, they're like mobile reliquies. So I don't know whether these little buckets are mobile reliquies or something to do with some sort of cunning practice. There's also been women who have been found that have had bags of random items like um, hagstones, um, Roman coins, animal claws, um, sort of bits and pieces. And one of the theories of that is it may have been either to fool the elves perhaps, because it, um, even now within sort of magical practice, if you want to, there's, there's the old saying, of, um, if you want to fool the devil, then you throw beans on the floor and the devil has to count them. So maybe it could be something that if you have a little bag of miscellaneous things, the spirits go, what is that? <laughs> and they're so interested in what's in your bag that it bother you. You know, so it's kind of, keeping yourself safe, little charms, or, or it could have been used for some sort of divination. I mean, the, the archaeologists don't know, they just find these little bags of random things. But they do think a lot of the things they're finding are women who are practicing some form of, sort of leech practice or cunning yeah. Yeah. practice. So I'm gradually building up my kit to sort of reflect that um, and acquiring things like chicken bones. 
<laughs> random bits and pieces and, and learning how to, to d- d- do divination by using lots, which is Wonderful. fascinating. Wonderful. But then that leads into a whole other art form as well, you know, and sort of pestering people like you to make tablet weave and things for my kit and having to you know, learn Anglo-Saxon runes and things. Yes. I mean, that, that, it, it does. It's like a can of worms, isn't it? When you start yeah. to get through a time period and, yeah, really think about where you can go with it and what role you want to portray. And I think um, it was some Regia people. Who, I don't know if you saw them uh on the internet and they did um their members laid out on their floors and put around them modern day what would be found in their grave and I just thought well, that's so interesting because that's what you think your life is but also you know the fact that you've got a guitar there and maybe some candles and stuff that's not your job yeah. if someone dug you up and they say oh well he's a musician who likes yeah. Candle light. Well, no, no. Yes. So that's exactly what we're doing when we're opening people's graves. We're going. Well, yeah. obviously, that's their job. Well, well, no. If they're buried with their favourite things and their best things, yeah. Or the other side of it as well is if you've got a lot of stuff to get rid of, what a great place to dump it. <laughs> oh, I love that as well. <laughs> oh no, great Aunt Matilda died. Oh, I've got that horrible broken glass goblet. I know. I'll put that in a grave. <laughs> yeah, maybe you had to bury something. Maybe that was part of the funeral rites. Oh, well, I never liked her. She can have this. I never, never liked him. He can have that. Bit of old stuff. <laughs> they won't mind in the mind. <laughs> This is the thing. We make all these assumptions, don't we, about, you know, what, like you're saying, what, about what our ancestors have in their graves. And, oh, yeah, and, and there's a horrible sweeping thing. They all look like this. Yeah. In this time period, they all wore these clothes. Did yeah. they really? Because when you start looking individually, they didn't. And it's kind of, we all sort of fall into this category, don't we, of sort of, this is what they looked like. And then you walk down the street and you see there's like a generic clothing, which is, you know, people will wear a dress or they'll wear a skirt or they'll wear jeans or they'll wear, then you have like sort of the business clothes and the school clothes. And, you know, somebody with terrible dress sense who might just be like me and just randomly put anything on and go out. <laughs> yeah. The clothes that do survive from Viking age are higher status clothes because they were buried whereas everyone else was probably just thrown on some cremation pile but yeah I'm well getting into textiles and archaeological reports at the moment and I'm like oh the the stitch count was what (laughs) (laughs) you see I read that and go who had the patience to do that (laughs) and they go I need somebody else to make this thing for me because I really don't have the patience to make that (laughs) It's, an, it's a nice journey though, isn't it? It's a nice journey to go on. So if people want to see examples of your work, where can they go to? They can go to my website, which is www.feejackson.co.uk. <laughs> There's also Dancing Magpie, which is on Facebook. Um, and I'm currently, I'm going to show you this because it's on my table. Please do. It's a mug that I made. I saw him with the wolf and, and I love the little saying that he's got on there. Yeah, the wolf says, um, in her spare time, Wolf rather enjoyed knitting sheep's clothing. So, <laughs> and there he is, <laughs> the ball of wool, knitting, knitting away. away. Um, but yeah, so I basically, normally, um, because I'm trying to earn a sensible living, haha, um, I'm doing things like greetings cards and mugs and tea towels and that sort of stuff and teaching a little bit of art on as well. Um, I'm also sort of starting up doing sort of historical art stuff i'm calling the archaeology it's only just beginning so it'll start to slowly appear i'm hoping that's the, kind of the next thing Ooh, look but yeah i'm also i do take on commissions as you know and i also do have a fascination with ancient art and i paint with earth pigments as well and have been known to use vellum in the past mm. so you know i can recreate certain things and I love sort of medieval artwork but don't ask me to do calligraphy because that's a whole dark art in itself (laughs) you know I can draw and I can paint and I can recreate most art styles uh, from different time periods just not the writing that goes with it (laughs) heck can you draw lady I think you've got amazing skills and I just love seeing new things when they pop up on you you mostly on facebook i must say so yeah i can see the things that are coming up from your workshop today and your musings daily musing today the snow and the view and this is happening and (laughs) all you guys you know i love all that yeah and i'm stuck i moved house rather suddenly just before christmas because my landlord sold our old house and i've gone from being in the 1700s cottage with farm around me to being in the middle of a town center very small tiny weeny shropshire market town 
And we're in what was quite a grand Georgian townhouse, rather, that then got turned into a shop and it's now a shop below us. Um, but I've, all my views upstairs are just rooftops. So I keep having Mary Poppins-esque moments. Oh, that's just lovely. <laughs> I've nowhere else to go, so I just think about rooftops, but I want to climb out the window and go forward <laughs> across them. <laughs> I'm not going to because it'll end a ball in, in a plummet and that would be terrible. <laughs> yeah, and you want to be careful that you don't get arrested for idolatry as well, being on a roof. Yes, putting my ch- I could put my child on the roof. <laughs> she won't fit in the oven. <laughs> no. <laughs> I'll have the church after me next. I'm on bread and water, not careful. Thank you very much for your time. It's been lovely seeing you and chatting to you. Oh, no, it's been so nice to see you properly. Ha-ha. Hello, that's what you really look like. Yeah. But yeah, hopefully our paths will cross in the real world and we can cavort around the cult bar at some point. I'd love, that. I'd love to do the YMCA in front of some spotlights with you. Anytime, mate. Anytime. <laughs> well, you have to have a bit of silliness, don't you? Oh, absolutely. That's what it's all about. Lovely seeing you. Contemplation Corner. Hello and thank you for joining me in Contemplation Corner. I'm Adam, as some of you may know, and I'm from Avalon Magic. Today we're going to be talking about the Festival of Beltane. The Great Wheel of the Year has now turned to Beltane. Along with Samhain, Beltane is the most important festival of the year, a cross-quarter festival that lays opposite Samhain on the wheel. Beltane marking the beginning of summer and of course Samhain marking the beginning of winter. Beltane is celebrated on May the 1st and it's Eve. In nature, we see all of wildlife and animals choosing their mate and breeding to provide and produce their offspring. Days are becoming longer as the wheel turns towards the longest day, midsummer solstice or letha. The sacred hawthorn tree is in blossom, majestically showing its white flowers against vibrant, lush and green leaves. This is the tree sacred to Beltane. It is a very magical tree and is linked with the fae or fairy folk, which in Norfolk we call the height of sprites. The little folk are very active on Beltane Eve and day, as they are at other festivals, especially Letha and Samhain. Often it was said that people who rested under the branches of a hawthorn could communicate with these beings or even enter the fairy realm, where it was very important not to eat or drink or partake in dancing with the fairy folk, for if they did, they would not be able to leave or leave after what might have been an hour or two in that realm, coming back to the mortal realm to find five years had passed, for instance, In Wiccan belief, Beltane is the time of the great marriage and the great rite, where the goddess marries her consort, the god, and makes loves to him. For this reason, it's traditional for hand fastings or pagan weddings to occur at Beltane. Bonfires were lit, often called bellfires. Besoms were jumped over. Beltane is a great celebration of fire, passion, sexuality, creativity and magic. And divination is often practised during Beltane as at Samhain. In the Avalonian tradition, we celebrate the goddess Rhiannon, great goddess of love and sexuality. She comes to us with her sacred animals, the white mare, the tweeting birds that fly through the air to herald her passage, and her dog that guards the entrance to the hollow hills, which at Beltane people have entered, either returning mad or full of inspiration and poetry. We also honour Ellen of the Trackways and Olwyn of the White Track, along with the beautiful flower-faced goddess Blagywith. 
These goddesses not only teach us how to love and to make love to others, but also how to love ourselves. At Beltane, we dance the Maypole. This is a phallic symbol of masculine and feminine energies, binding the red and white ribbons together. Red being the colour of the goddess, and white, of course, being the colour of the god. So, thinking about today, with all of us living as we do, slightly slower pace than in normal times, but again, the world is opening up now, how do we celebrate Beltane. If we are fortunate enough, enough to live near a maypole, we can dance and celebrate around that with friends and family. Or you can make a makeshift maypole. So if you have a tree in your back garden or front garden, you can attach the red and white ribbons to one of the branches and dance around the tree. Um, on Beltane Eve, you take walks in the wood or in the countryside and really deeply connect with the elements, walk with your partner if you have one, express to each other how much you care and love each other and really celebrate that union. Or equally, if you're a single, think of all those things you find beautiful about yourself. Think about those things that make you who you are, all those things that you're proud that you've achieved. What do you really love about yourself? And as you're walking, think, think about those things. Even if you want to look into a mirror that you possess once a day for a week and state one thing that you really love about yourself and you have to be really honest with this. Think of past relationships and the lessons learned from them. Perhaps you'd like to indulge in a ritual bath with some salts and some essential oils, and maybe some rose petals, just to really pamper the self. It's traditional to get up at dawn on Beltane, if you're an early bird. Go out into the garden and bathe your face, wash your face in the morning dew. And this was believed to make you beautiful for the next year or next year and a day. There are probably lots of Beltane ceremonies online. I know Glastonbury Goddess Temple has a Beltane ceremony coming up, which people can join. Um, and also as the guidance and the restrictions are being lifted, we're able to meet more greatly outside. So obviously, whatever guidelines are in your country, follow those for joining together. It's very important to join together in some way during this festival and all the other festivals of the Great Wheel. It's really lovely at this time for you to visit the sacred sites, especially the tri -vias, the three-way roads out in the country or perhaps around the base of Glastonbury Tour where there's a few of them and leave offerings to the goddess Rhiannon such as nuts and rose petals. Leave those nuts and rose petals to the fae at these triveers because the triveers are very sacred places linking the lower, the upper and the middle worlds together. A place of changing dimensions, of magic. During Beltane, perhaps find yourself a hawthorn tree and sit and meditate under that hawthorn tree. There's so much you can do at each of these festivals, but the main thing is to get out there, leave the indoors, walk, run, dance, through the meadows, through the fields, the country lanes, or even if you live in a city, there are spaces that have nature. Look for nature. I was in London recently and I heard what I thought was a green woodpecker overhead in one of the parks. And it was the most beautiful little green parakeet. So wildlife and nature is everywhere. And all you need to do for any of these celebrations is to get out there and to find it, to be with it, 
to be part of it because we are not separate to nature. We are nature. So whatever you do, I wish you many blessings, this Beltane. I wish you much love and much acceptance and wish that you heal from any sexual wounds that you may have. Thank you for joining me and I look forward to speaking with you again during my full moon forecast. Blessed Beltane. Thank you for tuning in to my podcasts every week. Over the summer season, things are suddenly getting very busy. The podcast will be released on the Sabbaths until the, at Samhain or Halloween, where I'll go to once a week again. See how I get on. If I can do more sooner, I will. I've really enjoyed presenting aspects of Dark Age reenactment and some fabulous people very much. If you've recorded an interview with myself and not heard it yet, it's on its way. So the next episode will be on the summer solstice, the 21st of June, then Lamas, 1st of August, and then Mabon, 21st of September, until Samhain, 31st of October. What an awesome journey this has been thus far, and long may it continue. Thank you for all your support. I hope to see you in a field somewhere over the coming months. Blessed be indeed. You've been listening to a Dracos.ir podcast for entertainment purposes. A massive thank you to all my guests today. All music for the podcast series provided by the amazing Dark Bardess. Find her on YouTube. Thank you for listening and I look forward to your company next time. Of silver.